I'm excited um, to teach you all a little about dermatology. Um, that is my specialty. I'm in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And um, today we'll go over um, kind of what it takes, the path to become a dermatologist and what I did in specifically uh, a typical day in the life and then a couple case studies. So I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. Um, I went to high school, of course, and then um, no one in my family was in medicine, really. Well, I have one nurse in my family, but besides that, no doctors or anything. And um, so I didn't really know what all it took or what all the path to get there. So I'm glad to teach people about it now because I wish I would have had some more um, like guidance early on. Once you get into college and of course medical school, there's a lot of advisors helping you along the way, but um, early on it's, it's a little bit hard to know what to do. Um, so after, so I moved from Mobile to Nashville, I did my undergraduate degree at Vanderbilt. I majored in molecular and cellular biology and Spanish, I did some research, um, some extracurricular activities, of course, and then took the MCAT. So those are all, you know, parts of your um, app, those, all, all those things go on your application to get into medical school. And then I actually took a year off in between college and medical school. And I, and I, I don't honestly know where I got that idea, but I always knew I wanted to do it. And I used that to travel. Um, really glad I did because even though I majored in Spanish during um, college, I, it really took like living there to become more comfortable with it. So I'll never regret that. It, I did take, I spent about half the year do, uh, finishing up some research after college. And at that time I was doing my um, med school application like interviews. And um, by the time I was done with all of that, I left for Guatemala for about six months. And then when I came back, I started medical school. So I went to UAB, which is in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it is a state school for, you know, Alabama residents, which is nice, um, but it's a, it's a really big university and they have a lot of different specialties. So I, I initially thought I wanted to do neurology, which is kind of a weird path to go from neurology to dermatology. They're very different. Um, but what I was really interested in, with, in is immunology and, um, there's a lot of that in dermatology. And so um, just kind of doing my rotations and getting more exposure during medical school, realized that dermatology was a better fit for me. Um, during med school, so you, you're still doing, you know, extracurricular activities and research because there's another application process to get into residency. And um, so at the end of your fourth year, you match into residency. And um, so you're kind of working on your application throughout med school and you do your interviews um, during your fourth year. And then at the end of your fourth year, you match. And I matched uh, at Tulane in New Orleans and I did both my internship there and my residency. Um, so in dermatology, most, um, most programs are, it's, it's called an advanced program. So you, you actually match at the same time into your first year of residency, which is called your internship. And that um, op most often people do internal medicine, but you can also do pediatrics or surgery. Um, and then, so I was at Tulane, but it was a different department. So it's the department of internal medicine. And then I finished up three years of residency at Tulane. And then I went into private practice. There is a, a you know, a chance, uh, some residents will do fellowships after their dermatology residency. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I was interested in being a general dermatologist. So uh, I was done after residency. And then a little bit about the field of dermatology. So um, we treat skin, hair, nails, and mucous membranes and, you know, uh, cancers or um, inflammatory conditions of those areas. We can treat and identify more than 3,000 conditions and we care for patients of all ages. 
So newborn babies up to senior adults. Um, so it's very diverse things that we take care of. So skin cancers, inflammatory skin conditions, infectious conditions. Um, there's also a lot of genetic conditions that have skin manifestations. So we recognize and treat those um, and then cosmetic concerns as well. And to be board certified, so um, at the end of your training, so you, you complete medical school, internship and residency, you have a license to practice medicine and then you have a board exam at the end of residency. And if you pass that, then you're considered board certified. And um, that's you know an important thing at the end of your residency because you can, um, you'll see the letters FAAD, Fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology. And that's a good way to know if someone is board certified in dermatology. The um, types of dermatology, they're most, and this is kind of the breakdown um, of the types of dermatologists out there. So the majority are gonna be medical dermatologists or general dermatologists, that's another name for it. Um, about a quarter do sur non-cosmetic surgery. So um, a surgical specialty, but not a focus in cosmetics necessarily. Um, and then 12% are focused on cosmetic. And most people will do a mix of medical dermatology, surgical, and cosmetic. You can also do um, fellowships and you, there's a pediatric dermatology fellowship. There's cosmetic fellowships. There's dermatopathology fellowships. Um, that is someone who reads slides of skin specimens. And you can either train in dermatology and then do a fellowship in dermatopathology or train in pathology and do the same fellowship. And um, then you read skin, skin slides. Um, Mohs surgeons is, a, that's a, that's a, a subspecialty or fellowship that um, is a specialized type of skin cancer surgery. So we'll talk about that. And then there's some other um, just very rare specialists that might be um, at big academic centers that might specialize in, um, you know, melanoma or uh, lymphomas of the skin or um, bullous diseases, which is um, like pemphigus vulgaris and those types of things. So that's, there's a lot you can do, or you can be general, which is what I like a little bit of everything. So that is why I did, you know, just general dermatology. So most dermatologists will work in clinics in private practice, um, but there are hospital-based groups. There's academic centers where they train residents and they're, um, you know, might take call at the hospital. And um, those often can be like referral centers when people in the community aren't, or, you know, are stumped or um, they need like a, a specialist, then, that those would be at academic centers. And then some Mohs surgeons will work at an ambulatory surgery center, which is um, like for outpatient procedures. And then my typical day, um, I get to work around seven and start at eight um, and go until about four, usually do get a break for lunch and see about 30 to 35 patients a day. Um, that's about one every 10 to 15 minutes or so. And then um, a couple, do a couple of surgical procedures at the end of my morning and at the end of the day. There's people who see less than this and people who see more than this. So you can kind of make, you know, do different people have different paces and um, it takes a lot of help in clinic to see, you know, more patients. So it just depends on the setup. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do besides, you know, seeing patients face to face, calling people back with results, um, reviewing everything that comes in, records re that you request or um, tests that you order, reviewing those results, and then um, there's a lot of back, you know, communication with staff, and they'll help you contact patients and whatnot. So, um, and then there's a lot of documentation, of course. So, busy. It's always very busy. 
the thing that I love about dermatology is that there are, it, it's very, there's a lot of variety. So, um, you know, I could go, I could have all my patients ready and there's a skin check in room one. There's a, a little baby with eczema in room two. There's someone with psoriasis and, you know, it just, it, it's a lot of variety, which makes the day, you know, no day the same and um, makes life very interesting. Or um, Also, we do a lot of, we're a very procedure heavy specialty and mostly like very minor procedures, um, like freezing with, with liquid nitrogen. Um, so we'll freeze precancerous growths or warts um, throughout the day. And sometimes we burn things. Um, a lot of times we'll biopsy things, we'll do excisions, some cosmetics. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of work with your hands and a lot of um, variety, which I love. Okay, so this is kind of the, the main part of this presentation. Um, wanted to um, do just some interesting things you might not have heard of. So this is a patient that might come to your clinic. And um, so this is a 56 year old African-American woman who presents to you for evaluation of hair loss. So anytime a patient comes in, no matter what the, no matter what the issue is, you get their history. So, you know, they tell you um, how long something's been going on, any symptoms associated. You go over their medical history, their family history, um, their medications, all that. So you get a history, um, you do an exam, of course, and um, we use something called a dermatoscope sometimes, um, or I, I do, and a lot of dermatologists do. And it, um, it helps to see a little bit deeper into the skin. I'll show you a picture of one, I think, coming up, but um, it's a little handheld device that you look through. And so when you're evaluating skin lesions or hair loss, it's very helpful. Um, biopsy, so we do a lot of biopsies. The nice thing about the skin is everything's right there. So if you're not sure or you need, or you want confirmation, you just take a little piece and send it to the pathologist. So that's always helpful. And then um, of course, going through your diagnosis and your treatment options with the patient. So that's kind of the overview of a lot of clinic visits. So for this patient, she says that she started, first noticed her hair loss about five years ago, and it's kind of slowly been getting worse and slowly um, that area has been getting bigger. Sometimes she has itching and burning. Um, you ask her about hair care practices, and right now she, ha she hasn't been doing anything for the last year or two, but she has um, previously used relaxants. And her mother has something similar. Um, but she has never had a diagnosis or treatment. And this patient has never had treatment before either. So when you look at the scalp, you look at the distribution of hair follicles. And obviously in this patch, she's lost quite a few hair follicles in this area. She still has some, but um, there's a significant loss of hair follicles. The skin underlying there is has a shiny appearance to it, and that's an important finding. And then she definitely has some erythema throughout this area. And then this is a picture of a dermatoscope. So it's nice, it's like goes in your pocket and um, you, I carry it around with me all day. So when you look at the scalp through the dermatoscope, some findings that you might see are um, kind of this background honeycomb-like pigment network, peripylar, gray-white halos, and there's a couple, this one is a good example. There's a little white halo around that hair follicle. Hair shaft variability, so some are thin. These are really thin. These are th really thick terminal hairs, um, so there's some variability. And then in some areas, you see more of a perifollicular erythema, so redness around the hair follicle. So anytime you see erythema like that, it's kind of a sign that there's inflammation. And then when you see kind of a shiny loss of hair follicles and this white 
color, that is a sign of scarring. So that is a, a sign or fibrosis. And that is when there's, you know, typically something starts, could start as inflammation. And as it progresses, it might lead to scarring. So that's why um, she's lost a lot of these hair follicles. So there's some different ways to approach alopecia. Alopecia is just a general name for hair loss. Um, there are a lot of different types of alopecia and you can kind of think of them as, you know, are they diffuse, mean affecting, meaning affecting like the majority of the scalp? Are they patterned? And there's a couple different patterns you might see that we'll kind of go through. Or are they circumscribed in just individual areas? So diffuse types of hair loss, there's things that you would think of, telogen effluvium and anogen effluvium. And um, it's, it's kind of hard to go into all of this, but telogen effluvium is a non-scarring hair loss. It's actually a, a shedding event, usually triggered by like stress or surgery or pregnancy or um, whatnot. So that is when the hairs that are in a certain phase called telogen shed. And then anagen effluvium is usually after like chemotherapy when you lose your hair. Less common, there's some other types of less common diffuse hair loss. And then pattern hair loss, that is a term um, usually referring to male and female pattern hair loss. And that is um, based on really hormones. So your certain hair follicles are gonna be sensitive to hormone, hormone changes. And so in men, or you'll see in women, you could get a widened part in the middle. Um, women tend to get uh, thinner hair at the vertex or the top. And men might get that, or and they get this bitemporal recession. And that's just because those, those follicles in those areas are sensitive usually to male hormone. Um, and then there are types. Um, so alopecia areata, areata means coin shaped. Um, but when people say like I have alopecia, alopecia, they often are mistaking it for alopecia areata or alopecia totalis or alopecia universalis, and that's when the whole, you lose all the hair. Alopecia areata is when it happens in patches. Um, and there's a pattern where you lose it um, like around the whole, out, the whole periphery of your, of your um, hairline. And then, so kind of depending on what, what is affected, you're kind of thinking through these, this is called a differential diagnosis when you're thinking of what something could be um, and you kind of base your clinical impression on these patterns and you're kind of going through this quickly in your head. And then um, also, so scarring and non-scarring alopecias. So scarring alopecias tend to have that inflammation and then that shiny loss of follicles. Non-scarring, you might see thinning of the hair, you usually don't see a lot of inflammation. Um, so hair loss that's circumscribed, so certain areas and non-scarring, so alopecia areata, which is when it's like little circles, um, tinea capitis, which is fungal infection, trichotillomania, which is when someone pulls at their hair, syphilis, and pressure alopecia. And then circumscribed and scarring. So if that can be further um, broken down into if you see inflammation or evidence of inflammation or you don't. So inflammatory types of scarring alopecias are this CCCA, which is central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, lichen planopilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, discoid lupus, folliculitis to Calvans, dissecting cellulitis, and acne chelidalis. So these are um, all kind of distinct types of scarring alopecias. And then you can also, sometimes you come in 
or some, a patient comes to you and it's already kind of in stage alopecia, something has happened, but it probably happened in the past and it's kind of burnt out now. So you don't see any more inflammation. So what you set, decide to do is get a biopsy because this will help you um, when you're looking at these possibilities. Um, you know, there's going to be ones that are more, more likely than others, but you kind of have narrowed it down to this is your differential. And when you get your biopsy, you, we use what will be called a punch biopsy, which looks like a little cookie cutter. And um, you take a little plug of skin to include the hair follicles. And what they see is, so you see a decreased follicular density areas of concentric follicular scarring. So you get collagen and um, scarring around hair follicles. And then you see that in the perifollicular collagen, this is um, called hyalinization. And it means it kind of becomes um, thickened and um, it's a sign of scarring or fibrosis. Premature loss of the inner root sheath. So that, that is happening in the inner root sheet that should, um, you, you lose that early in certain conditions. And then you also see, you know, this is inflammation happening around here, which could, which could explain the redness that you see clinically. So all that together, the pathologist would give you their most likely differential and based on what you know about different types of scarring alopecias, where they occur, um, what, um, you know, even patient demographics, you know, all that comes, plays a role in coming to your most likely diagnosis. And so this is a hair loss that is called CCCA. Of course, they give it a name that's hard for anybody to like, say, but central, which means it happens, it's typically it presents um, kind of in the center of the scalp, centrifugal, meaning it expands outward from the center, cicatricial, which means scarring, and alopecia, which means hair loss. So CCCA. Oh, I am missing some slides. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Hmm. Sorry guys. <laughs> Let me see if this one has it. No. Hold on. Oh, I have so many. Okay, well, I'll tell you what I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm sorry, technical difficulties today. So CCCA is, um, m is most common in, in African-American women, but it can happen in any race and it can happen in men as well. So um, it used to be called hot comb alopecia, which, um, I don't really, that term has definitely fallen out of favor um, because it really kind of blames the patient. It's, it's not completely related to hair practices, but they, it used to be kind of uh, blamed on that. There's been some genetic um, or some genes that are found more frequently in patients with CCCA. So we don't totally understand, but it's, it's probably like most, like a lot of things, it's a combination of genetics and um, environmental factors, meaning like what, what, um, what the scalp is exposed to. Um, and then treatment wise, you, we use a lot of times intralesional steroid, which we inject um, throughout this area. When, when hair follicles are lost, 
you can't really like, unless you do a hair transplant, which you can in certain cases of CCCA, you can't really um, bring them back. You can definitely um, keep it from spreading and that's always the goal, but you wanna, you do try to get as much regrowth as possible. So um, you would, you could do intralesional steroids, topical steroids too. Um, those aren't my favorite because it's it doesn't really penetrate to the depth that you need. So doing some injections every six to eight weeks or so. And um, we use uh, doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, but we use it for anti-inflammatory purposes. Um, and that can be used sometimes even three or six months. So it, a long time. Um, we use something called hydroxychloroquine sometimes, which it's actually a malaria medication, but in dermatology, we use it for um, lupus and we use it for certain scarring or fibrosing conditions. And this is one of them. Um, and then you do always counsel about hair practices and as much as possible avoiding um, excessive heat, uh, relaxants if possible. And there's sometimes where it's not possible to avoid relaxing the hair. Um, it's just, it's somewhat, you know, you can't, um, some patients just won't or can't stop doing that. So you give them tips on, you know, using petrolatum to coat the scalp um, when they get relaxants and try not to let the relaxant come in contact with the scalp. And then um, trying to space it out to like every eight weeks or something rather than doing it too frequently. So um, you could potentially get this to fill back in, um, but it's kind of setting expectations that you may or may not be able to is really important at the beginning. Um, and sometimes people come and it's really progressed and they've already lost so many hair follicles. So in that situation, you know, sometimes you just have to, you can do what you can, but, or try what you, try treatment, but knowing that it might not be possible to go without a wig um, just up, up front. So there's a lot of handholding and talking through the diagnosis, realistic expectations and the treatment options. And then hair transplant, you try to calm down any active inflammation, um, but in stage when you know there's not any more improvement that you can get with medications, then you could refer to um, there's certain dermatologists that are actually in other specialties too, but in dermatology, you can do a fellowship in hair transplant. So um, that is a little overview of CCCA. And then moving on to case two. So a lot of what you, what I do as a dermatologist is um, doing skin checks in patients that come in with certain growths or and knowing what needs a biopsy, um, what can be, you know, what you can reassure the patient about that's not harmful is a big part of what, what we do. So this case is a 72 year old man and he presents for skin lesions on the back that his wife is concerned about. That's super common um, for, men to come in and just say, I don't know, my wife sent me. So um, you look him over. Well, first you get a history. And he, sometimes they don't, they're like, well, I don't know. It's just, I can't see it. It's, not, it's there. I don't know how long it's been there. Um, they could tell you if it itches or not, or if it's bothersome, but otherwise they might not, they may or may not give you much history. Um, you do a skin exam. So you look at, for him, you just look him over while he's there and you, you use your dermatoscope, or I would. Um, and then if you see anything that needs a biopsy, I, I do it the same day. And then you go over your plan. So same, that's kind of the same um, routine for most of your visits. So starting kind of head to toe, you see this spot on his ear and you ask him about it. And it's not uncommon for people to be like, oh yeah, I do remember that. Um, and you know, he says, oh yeah, I think my glasses are just irritating that. Um, and sometimes it bleeds, but you look at it and you're like, eh, that's actually a growth. Um, and the way that you could describe that is it's erythematous. So this is red or pink ulcerated. So it has this heme crust over, you know, that's an ulcer. 
and it has these pearly rolled borders. So you use your dermatoscope and you don't have to, but like you can make a clinical diagnosis here most likely, but um, I like to use my dermatoscope. And you see these atypical, they're called arborizing blood vessels, which means they have branches like a tree. And of course you see this very big ulceration. So you decide that clinically and dermoscopically there's some features that are suspicious and you should biopsy it. So I'd biopsy that, that day and you would numb up the area and just do what's called a shave biopsy, which is shaving it off and um, sending that to the pathologist. So you keep looking and um, you come across this spot on the chest. And he's like, oh, I don't, I have, I have, I've never noticed that. And there's, there's no symptoms involved. So you don't get much history. You just ha you have your exam. You use your dermatoscope and you can see that it's quite irregular. So it's, it's asymmetric in its overall architecture. And um, it has an atypical pigment network. So this pigment network, there's this area here that um, is kind of like a blotch. Um, there's some thick areas of the network. There's some thinner areas. So there's really no symmetry about that pattern. Um, there's some atypical dots and globules that are scattered. So overall, quite an atypical spot. So based on its irregularity, both clinically and on dermatoscope, um, um, you also biopsy this. And then, you know, you let them know, tell your wife, these are nothing to worry about. So these are um, clinically, they're hyperkeratotic, which just means they're thick. Um, stuck on appearance is very classic for these. It almost looks like you could take your fingernail and scratch it off. You can't, but it has that appearance to it. Very well defined. Also just that there's, there's many that look the same is kind of another um, reassuring feature when you're just looking overall at skin lesions. So you reassure patient, these are okay. These are called seborrheic keratoses and you don't have to do anything about these. So after that, after you did your biopsies that day, you would send off your specimen to the pathologist. It takes a few days to um, process the specimen. You know, they, you put it in formalin and that fixes the tissue. Um, they get it at the lab. Um, they process it and stain it and then put it, they cut it in a way that the pathologist then looks at it on a slide under the microscope. So this is what your pathologist might see on that ear lesion. Um, there is a large proliferation of basaloid cells, and that means they're very purple blue. Um, that's the way that they're taking up that stain. Scant cytoplasm and hyperchromatic nuclei. So when a nuclei, when a cell and a nucleus has a lot of DNA, it looks darker like this. So that is a sign that those cells are active in their DNA replication. Um, peripheral palisading is a, another feature. And that means that when you look at the edges, the cells kind of line up along the periphery and the nuclei, it all it kind of creates this called palisading at the edges. And then you also have this clefting. So the cells separate from the stroma around them and they have this cleft. So those are all very characteristic features of a basal cell carcinoma. So how do we treat basal cells? They, it's by far the most common type of skin cancer. So I probably see multiple of these, whether I'm biopsying one or treating one every day. Um, the treat, 
treatment options depend on where on the body it's, it is, how big it is, and the histologic subtype. So there are certain subtypes um, that are low risk for recurrence, um, and there are certain ones that are kind of sneaky, sneaky and go out into the skin around them in a way that um, makes them more likely to recur. So the options are um, for low risk subtypes, you can do a procedure called electrodesiccation and curatage, which means you um, scrape away the tumor, you burn it, scrape it, burn it. You do that series of three times and it leaves them with like kind of a sore spot to heal, no stitches. It's just like a, like a scrape that has to heal. Excision, um, that is when you take a margin of normal skin around the spot, cut it out and stitch it back. So I, I, do, I do both electrodesiccation and curatage and excisions. Mohs surgery, um, I have a slide on this, but that's, that is reserved for places where there's not a lot of extra skin and you really need to do a skin sparing procedure. Um, so we'll talk about that. For very uh, low risk, like usually just the superficial type of basal cell, sometimes you can use a cream, um, chemotherapy or immunotherapy cream to get rid of it. And then radiation is sometimes used, it's like superficial radiation. And that is more for people who are not surgical candidates or if it's too large to take care of any other way, you can do superficial uh, radiation treatment. So for Mohs surgery, this is um, kind of a schematic of what that means. Mohs, um, the name comes from the doctor who invented the procedure. And it is it has to do with the process of how they remove it and how they um, put it on the slide or mount it basically to where it's almost like if you think of a bowl, and the way that they look at the, the margins of the area they remove is they look at all the edges and the bottom um, of the whole, it, it allows for 98% of the margins to be examined. Um, so they start with what they see visibly and they go maybe a millimeter just right around it. Um, the patient waits and there's a histology, usually um, like lab technicians that are processing the tissue um, while the patient waits. They look under the mic, then the, the Mohs surgeon is also the pathologist in this case. So they look at their own slides. They look under the microscope at all the margins. If the margins are clear, then they could go back and, and either sew up the patient or um, make a plan basically to close whatever defect is left. If it's positive, in this case, in this like diagram, you can see that there's still some microscopic tumor at the base. So they would go back and they would just take more at the base. And then they would, the patient would wait again and they process that under the microscope to see if then those margins are clear. If not, they go again, and those are called stages or layers, and they take just a little bit each time um, until the, microscopically there's no more cancer at the margins. So it's pretty cool. And that's that's a, the, called the Mohs technique. So that's what, um, for that ear, what I would do is refer to a Mohs surgeon, and there's a Mohs surgeon in my group, not all groups, have a Mohs surgeon. So sometimes you're referring to a different practice, um, but ours has both mostly general dermatologists and one Mohs surgeon who then treats everything that we need Mohs for. So the other spot, a little bit more um, serious, I guess, of a spot um, when you send the specimen to the pathologist. They look at under the microscope and what they can see is a proliferation of atypical melanocytes, 
along the epidermis. So typically melanocytes are either singly spaced along the epidermis or sometimes they're in little nests. Um, and they, there's kind of normal behavior for melanocytes and then there's atypical um, characteristics or behavior of melanocytes. And um, when they proliferate along the epidermis, when they start to become confluent or the nests that are supposed to be spaced out start to join together, um, those are all concerning features. Also something called pagetoid spread. Usually the melanocytes are on the basal layer so when they start to proliferate in a way and then they're, they're higher up in the epidermis, um, that's, that's abnormal. Um, so this is enough to call it, because there's a lack of dermal invasion, so it, this, the melanocytes are just in the epidermis, that is called melanoma in situ in this case, the, which means it hasn't gone into the dermis yet. When it does invade into the dermis, then it's a invasive melanoma or you know a, a regular full-blown melanoma. And what they do for melanomas when um, for melanoma in situ, we'll talk about staging. But for if it's beyond in situ, if it's an invasive melanoma, then they will actually measure how deep it goes from the top of the near the top of the epidermis to the base of what the lowest uh, dermal component is, gives you the depth of a melanoma. And that'll come, that'll, that's important later. So we'll talk about that. Um, well, or now. So the staging of melanoma is, you know, most cancers are based, the staging is called the TNM staging. And that stands for tumor, node, and metastasis. So, for tumor in melanoma, you're looking at the thickness most commonly, uh, or, mo or first and foremost, rather. Um, we'll talk about some other features, but you're looking at how deep the tumor goes, uh, the lymph node status. So um, do they have a positive uh, lymph node nearby? And then metastasis, which is, has it spread to other organs? And, um, the American Joint Committee on Cancers, the AJCC, they come up with these staging criteria and every so often they are updated. Um, and then based on the staging, the NCCN makes treatment guidelines. So whenever you see a melanoma, it's important to, or whenever you diagnose a melanoma, you have to kind of work through what, what stage it is and then that dictates the treatment that's necessary. So um, melanoma in situ, this, the tumor depth, stand, this stands for in situ, is actually stage zero. So it's not actually, um, you know, there's no stage yet for that. It's early and the cure rate is actually very high when you catch it when it's in situ. Um, and then, so that's our, our patient's stage. Um, stage one and two, it all, as the tumor thickness increases is how you determine if their overall clinical stage is a one A or B or two A or B. And that there's specific numbers that you, um, that depends on, on your tumor stage. And then once you once the melanoma gets into a lymph node, you're at least a stage three. And um, once the melanoma spreads somewhere, like another organ, then you're a stage four. So it all kind of starts with that first biopsy of a melanoma. So um, you, we are looking at very small numbers. So one millimeter of depth um, up to four millimeters of depth is kind of the range of these tumor stages. And um, once a tumor reaches 
definitely one millimeter, but even 0 0.8 millimeters, which is so thin um, in general, but it's for 0 0.8, if there's any other risk fe high risk features such as ulceration, then that makes the patient, um, they need to be recommended or advised to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So as a dermatologist, it's our job to find the melanoma. And once we get that pathology report, we need to know what to do with it. So um, if they qualify for a sentinel lymph node biopsy, then they're referred over to a surgical oncologist. So let's see. A sentinel lymph node biopsy. Sentinel, it's like the, the guards, um, you know, protecting the area. So lymph nodes are in um, clusters like in the neck. There's chains of lymph nodes in the armpit, in the groin. Um, so the way that a sentinel lymph node biopsy is performed, um, typically, you know, the patient has had the biopsy done. If they qualify for a lymph node biopsy, then the surgical oncologist will both do a wide local excision around that melanoma. And they'll also, at the same time, when this patient's under anesthesia, they'll inject a radioactive blue dye into the area. And then they give it a, however long, a few minutes or something. And they actually can use a Geiger counter to um, tell which, where the lymph node is, where that first closest lymph node is that's picking up that dye, which means it's draining that area. And then because it's blue, when they go to dissect the area and cut down to the lymph node, it actually, you see blue, a blue lymph node. So you know you've gotten the right one or multiple, you know, oftentimes they might, or they might get multiple, but that is how you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And um, then the pathologist will look at that under the microscope. And if, if it's negative, that's great. You know, the, the, um, it doesn't completely rule out the chance that the melanoma has spread, which is pretty scary, but um, it is a good indicator of, of has this, is this spreading? If it's positive, then of course you go down, um, you know, you're at least at a stage three and you're doing a lot more, um, the treatment changes quite a bit. So the melanoma treatment is, is dependent on stage. So stage zero, the in situ, um, typically anywhere that you can, you um, do a wide local excision and that's something that I do when, when a melanoma is on, typically on the trunk or the extremities. Um, if it's in a place that you don't have a lot of extra skin, like kind of the head and neck, um, backs of the hands, places like that, then most surgeons can remove a melanoma. Um, there's a couple ways they do it, but they can use a special stain when they're um, treating a melanoma that's different than the stain that they would do for regular skin cancers. So Mohs surgery is a good option in certain situations. And a miquimod is actually a topical immunotherapy. That is, um, it's not, it's definitely not um, the standard of care, but certain patients that are, if you're very, very elderly, there's no way a surgery is possible. Um, there are certain situations where you might be able to use a cream. Um, there's a lot of nuances involved to that, but it's um, typically you try to excise or do most. So stage one, so once that tumor gets a little bit thicker or, or actually invades, then um, you do a wide local excision. And depending on how deep it is or certain features of the tumor on histology, you would do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, and then if they have lymph node, if the lymph node turns out to be positive, or if, um, you know, certain, there's sometimes when imaging, 
like a PET scan or something is indicated, if you if they are having certain symptoms, then um, if you see metastasis, of course the therapy the treatment gets much more intense. Um, there's a lot of immunotherapy that is um, that really has revolutionized melanoma treatment and survival in the last 10 years or so. Um, there's targeted therapies that target certain genetic mutations um, in the melanoma. There's certain chemotherapy that's still used sometimes. Um, there's actually a vaccine that's used. And then there's radiation that um, sometimes that's more palliative. So for example, if you have um, metastases to the brain, um, you might do palliative radiation. So survival, survival is um, directly dependent on the stage, which makes sense. Um, so this, and I left the um, caption in here because, so comparison of survival curves in four stages of melanoma, and it's based on 2009 AJCC melanoma TNM classification, which we talked about, and prior to the advent of targeted therapy or immunotherapy. So they're still collecting a lot of data on survival since these immunotherapies have come out because it's getting, it is getting better. Um, so as you can see, if you look at, this is called a, um, so survival rate, so the percentage of patients who survive and um, over time, over the years. So stage one is fairly high. So that's our early or thin melanomas. Um, fairly good survival. Stage two, so that's a thicker melanoma. Stage three, which is when the lymph node is involved. And then stage four, which is metastatic, of course has very um, low survival, unfortunately. And then this, these are called um, Kaplan-Meier curves. And it's something that you'll, you might see a lot of in certain uh, medical literature. But um, this, so over here is stage um, 1A through 2C. And you can see the thinner, it's directly related to the depth. So the depth, that depth that you measure on under the microscope is the most important feature um, to look for in terms of predicting survival. So thin, thin melanomas, very high survival. Once you're down to a 2C, the five-year survival is 82%. And that's, you know, that's still, that patient still had a negative lymph node biopsy. So there's other, um, there's a lot to it. And we're trying to develop certain tests and molecular studies and genetic studies to um, help determine why certain patients might not do well, even though they had a negative lymph node biopsy. And then stage three, those are um, the lymph node, or excuse me, yeah, the um, different lymph node, um, the amount of lymph nodes and the location of the lymph nodes, um, it drops off as you get higher in stage. So for our patient, melanoma in situ, honestly, I go, like good news. Um, this just needs to be excised and I'll do it in clinic. I'll measure one centimeter around or up to one centimeter around it, excise it, and then see the patient back. Um, and usually you do every three months for a couple of years and then you space it out to six months and then, you know, so you just watch them. Okay, so that's it. So that wasn't too long. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions or? There's some questions in the chat. If okay, you let me look. Let's see if I can find that. I feel so, let's see. Chat, here we go. Okay, did I like Vandy? Um, it was great, it's a great place. They have a great um, medical center beautiful campus. Yes, I definitely enjoy going there for sure. And then, um, and I got a lot of good, you know, 
research experience, a lot of um, mentors from there. So that was nice. Um, they're very, you know, the teaching and stuff is excellent. Do volunteer hours you earned in high school count when you are applying to med schools, like when submitting total volunteer hours to med schools on your application? Um, I think I probably included one or two. Um, I, did, I don't remember putting actual numbers of hours. You do put the years that you did something. So they'll be able to see if it was during high school or during college. Um, I think I did put, I was involved in like one thing that was really important to me. So I think I did include that, but typically they're mostly interested in what you've done during college. And I would, I think, um, and what types of cases are your bread and butter common typical things? So bread and butter would be skin checks, moles, um, skin cancers, psoriasis, see quite a bit, eczema, um, warts, molluscum, those are all like, you know, bread and butter stuff that comes in all the time. And would you say that studying dermatology as a resident and a medical student had a competitive environment? I've heard that dermatology is a competitive career path. So has that been a recent change? So dermatology is, is one of the more competitive specialties. Um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of that stems from how many slots there are available. So, um, you know, there's more people that want to do it than there are spots to train them. So it, um, you know, you do starting, if you, if you want to have any interest in going into any competitive specialty, um, starting when you start off med school, just kind of starting from the beginning, trying to be, um, you know, competitive, not in like a, in, you know, you want to be a team player and like work well with others. Um, they're not, everybody does that, unfortunately, but it, it depends on the, the school and the, some, some schools are more competitive. There's more of a competitive environment than others. I did not feel that I was around a lot of competitive people. So it just really depends on where you are. Um, but you just do your best and make yourself, you know, a good applicant, no matter what you're interested in. Do you have a lot of patients who you interact with on a regular basis? For sure, yeah, I have, um, the nice thing about dermatology is that a lot of times you're seeing patients over time. So your patients that need their regular skin checks that have a lot of skin cancers, you see them for their visit and then you see them for their treatment and then see them again six months later, you know, yes, there's um, a lot of things that require monitoring. Um, so it, it is nice, you get to know a lot of your patients for sure. Do you know of any research mentors willing to mentor high school students or who work in laboratories? So that, um, I am not, you know, sure offhand, but I do know if you live in a city that has a medical school, sometimes there'll be programs where they'll do, um, they'll set you up with somebody. So it's definitely worth looking into either like a local, your lo if there's a local medical school, which I know that's not everywhere, but um, or even a university, they might have programs that that aim to mentor or help get high school students interested. So I would look on their websites for sure. I know UAB, where I went to med school, has a program for high school students. So it's definitely, it's definitely possible. Does wearing hats actually cause hair loss or is that a myth? Um, wearing hats... If they're too tight, you can get a, like a pressure alopecia, technically. Um, there's also something called acne chelidalis nuke, which may or may not have to do with like collar rubbing on the back of the neck or hats. Um, that we're not really sure why that happens on, in that area, but um, I wouldn't say, I would say typically, no, it's unless it's super tight. So just, don't worry, super tight. Uh, when you work in private practice, is the derm pathologist in-house or do you send the biopsy specimens elsewhere? So ours is, is actually in a whole nother state. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so they sometimes they'll be in-house and it might just be like down the hall that you could go talk to your pathologist, which would be nice. But um, a lot of times, you know, depending on where you're working, um, they are somewhere else and a courier actually comes and takes the specimens, goes, you know, it gets, has to get transported to the pathology lab. Um, so that's how ours is. It's not anywhere near us. Why do some find it preferable to work in a private practice over a hospital? So this, um, there's a lot that goes into deciding where you want to work. So um, in private practice, if you're, you could be part owner or you could be an employee um, in a hospital, you're definitely, you know, going to be an employee and kind of the, the autonomy is going to be different. So whether you can decide how you want to do something or um, how you want your schedule to look or who you hire in terms of your help support staff. Um, so that there's going to be you know, differences in autonomy and in payment structure. So um, there's kind of differences in that, that regard. And some people, you know, want to own a private practice and deal with all the administration and the hiring and billing. And there's a lot that goes into like the business side of medicine. Some people want nothing to do with that and want to just be an employee. Um, so it just, you kind of figure that out towards the end and you can change sometimes, you know, in your career, you can, um, might work in one place and then change your mind. So, um, there's a lot that goes into that decision and it's just different for everybody. Um, how many years of school did you have to do? So four years of college, four years of medical school and four years of residency.